Uh, yes, my room, go to you. Okay, lovely. Yes, yes, yes we can hear you clear. Lovely, thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by IPRI. I am Maryam Fatima and I shall be your moderator for the day. So the subject for today is the nexus of climate change and national security in the context of Pakistan in general. It might be considered an odd thing to mix concepts of climate change and national security in this manner, but in the recent past, threats to the physical and environmental position of our planet has raised numerous questions about its potential impacts on national security. So changing geography due to climate change can adversely affect military installations and sensitive sites that exist all across the country, everywhere <clears throat> on the planet, and thus increase suffering from natural disasters and the constant need to divert funds to repeated attempts at rebuilding and restoration, which leaves very little to go towards actual economic growth and the creation of, say, export quality goods and services. Um, a changing climate will have real impacts on our military and the way it executes its missions. The military is called upon more and more often to support civil authorities and provide humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And thus, climate change affects our armed forces' ability to defend the nation and poses immediate risks to Pakistan's national security. I'd like all participants and attendees to please note for their benefit that this webinar is also being live streamed on YouTube and can be found there later on. Um, now I shall call upon uh, Brigadier Retired Rashid Bali Janjua to deliver a short welcome note for the attendees. Mr. Janjua has served in various command and instructional assignments, including PMA and Command and Staff College Quetta a scholar and a regular esteemed op-ed contributor at renowned publications and now serving as director of research at IPRI with his vital contributions. Um, whenever you're ready, sir, please feel free. Thank you very much. A very warm welcome to uh, the distinguished panelists and uh, the participants of this webinar. This is a very important uh, webinar and uh, we would look forward to a very enthusiastic uh, participation. I'm sure we've got a stellar uh, cast of the speakers and uh, it would be our endeavor to extract the maximum out of them. And I would encourage the participants to uh, keep a note of what they say and uh, ask some uh, searching questions because uh, this is a subject which is uh, of utmost importance. And uh, all these uh, subjects, they form warp and woof of our uh, national security because they are uh, directly related to the human security. And uh, I'm sure uh, at the end of the session, we'll all be uh, much the wiser on the subject. And uh, I hope that it's going to be a very rewarding and very gratifying learning experience. Uh, with this, I would not like to interpose myself any longer between the speakers and the participants of this webinar. And uh, we would like uh, each speaker uh, to confine uh, the time slot so that we have maximum uh, time for the discussion part. And uh, in that, I would urge the participants to uh, ask some searching questions and uh, be very involved in this important webinar. So with this, uh, I hand you uh, back the proceedings. And please uh, invite the speakers for their discourse. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jindruwa. Now, furthering on, on our panel of speakers today, we have with us three esteemed professionals, uh, Mr. Sohail Malik, Dr. Khalil A. Khan, and Ms. Larev Farhat. We shall kick off the discussion with Mr. Sohail Malik from the Climate Resourcing Coordination Center. He also has experience in matters of climate change and has also previously been involved with the Green Climate Fund. Sir, in the next uh, several minutes, could you please tell us more about the topic at hand and also the vacuum in public policy and security within that regard? Many thanks uh, for this uh, very nice introduction. And I, uh, I was really looking forward to this occasion. 
because it touches my heart, the whole issue. So uh, I'll be making a PowerPoint presentation. So uh, I mean, uh, if you allow me, I can start sharing the screen immediately because we have time short. I don't want to take up uh, time for the questions and answers. Sure thing. So, great. So please let me know if you can see my screen whenever you can see my screen. Um, yes, so, we can. So the title of my presentation is uh, Climate Change, Public Policy Vacuum, as you mentioned, and National Security. So that is the title of my presentation. I'll be making it in four parts. First one being contacts, second, the interrelationships, third, the policy issues and vacuums, and fourth, going forward. So let me get going on the context first. So on the context, uh, let me just check and let me just first share the global one and which I think most of us uh, would be aware of um, this uh, lo uh, global context. Um, uh, so uh, climate change, as everyone knows, is a severe threat uh, for, to the global prosperity and security. 70% of the world's states, including Pakistan, are facing climate change as a national security challenge. Climate change is like terrorism, if I may say, which cannot be eradicated, but can be downgraded with the passage of time and interventions. Uh, climate change cannot be addressed without including military. And I'll come to this in detail later. We have seen in 2010 super floods, 20 million were displaced, incurring 10 billion of economic losses. In 2022 floods, 21 million were displaced, incurring 15.2 billion of economic losses. Mass migration is an incremental consequence of climate change. Water scarcity, floods, droughts, cyclones, migration, they all engender political brawls and resentment among locals. We can uh, take an example of Balochistan where the local floods felt threatened by non-locals such as Afans and um, uh, I mean Punjabis. Coming to the 18th Amendment, it has lessened conflicts among provincial governments, but climate change has amplified issues among provinces, in particular water distribution has become a major challenge. Um, let me try to move on with my screen. Now I will come to the interrelationships, the second part. So it's uh, when, when I see into the interrelationships, uh, because I, it, I have to see it from the global perspective first. So uh, as most of you know that the United Nations Security Council has also acknowledged the relationship between climate change and conflict. US Department of Defense has also declared climate change as a threat multiplier. And if we see in the uh, evolution, we see US Naval War College began studying interrelationships in 80s. The Defense Department followed and has undertaken steady stream of analysis over the past three decades. Even the recent US intelligence community reports conclude climate change is likely to fuel competition for resources, economic distress, and social discontent. Climate hazards such as extreme weather, high temperatures, droughts, floods, wildfires, storms, sea level rise, soil degradation, and acidifying oceans are intensifying, threatening infra critical infrastructure, health, well-being, and water and food security. <clears throat> um, and for, from Pakistan pers perspective, I'll just make a few points. Not all, I mean, these are just a few uh, touch points uh, that Pakistan's civil, uh, civilian casualties from climate change have been far greater than casualties from terrorism. Climate change is causing widespread migration from rural to urban, for which the government is poorly equipped to handle. This has serious implications for national security. The urban centers simply cannot cope with such a migrant influx. Such migration and poor absorption capacity can cause political instability and social interest, a uh, social unrest. In terms of regional security, conflict with India over water resources is a distinct possibility. 
Now coming to the issues and vacuums. Um, Pakistan over the last 40 years has been exposed to increased threats of climate crisis, like 1993 to 2002 drought, 2010 and 2022 floods, intermittent extreme heat waves, glacial outbursts, and sea intrusion, which had severe implications on its economic and social fabric. Despite escalating climate threats, the coping mechanisms have remained extremely weak due to critical gaps within the current climate policy framework of Pakistan, mainly due to its inability to integrate climate change, socioeconomic sustainable development, and national security agenda. So these three agendas have not been uh, integrated. As policymakers have limited or no knowledge, exposure, or experience in climate change, the related threats and consequences remain unaddressed in terms of policymaking processes and their implementation. Despite the evident climate change threats, the security dimension of climate change remains largely absent, both from policy and discourse in Pakistan. There is no policy or action plan to address climate change as security threat. It is also absent from literature or research studies, particularly those based on primary data, therefore failing to provide a comprehensive understanding of the problem. Media and discourse in Pakistan mainly cover security challenges from non-state actors. Climate change threats are not being taken seriously by policymakers, academia, media, civil society, or even the public. Now, let me come to the most important part is going forward. Before we move on to how to move uh, forward, I mean, we have to see the global outlook uh, from 2050 and beyond. National security threats posed by climate changes are likely to differ in degree, not in kind. Climate change will amplify humanitarian crisis, some resulting in deployment of military personnel, material and financial assistance. It will also aggravate natural resources constraints, potentially contributing to political and economic conflict over water, food, and energy. If emissions continue to creep upwards, the climate-related national security threats could be existential. It could fundamentally reshape geopolitics and possibly even the nation-state basis of the current global order. The key question would then be, can the global order, uh, oh, sorry, let me get back. I think I, can the global order premised on the nation, um, uh, I'm having a problem, nation state system itself based on territorial sovereignty survive in a world in which substantial parts of territory are based on um, or are potentially unlivable. So coming uh, now finally to recommendations for Pakistan's climate policy development and implementation. Since last decade, extreme um, uh, have heat, heat wave and massive flooding have been alternating resulting in loss of lives, livelihoods, land, critical infrastructure, incurring humongous economic costs. Pakistan needs to treat these reoccurring and escalating climate disasters as national security emergencies. Before this spark conflicts, adding another serious conflict to the first time poly crisis hitting Pakistan. So collaboration and coordination between the federal and provincial governments is of prime significance, particularly after the 18th Amendment, when water, food, and agriculture and environment were devolved to the provinces while climate change remained a federal subject. This disconnect needs to be resolved urgently for Pakistan to meaningfully assume its leadership role in the international arena to take forward the agenda of climate change. While building upon own successful response experiences like NCUS, NCUC during COVID-19, it also needs to take cognizance of leading country experiences as well in climate policy. We have seen that 
countries in Latin America like um, Chile, like Colombia, they, they have been declared as world leaders in policy making. And they, they, they are good examples to follow to set up a comprehensive and an overarching institutional mechanism to address challenges of climate change, particularly in the context of its national security imperatives. In addition, international level opportunities should be optimally harnessed, for example, effectively deploying the US-Pakistan Climate and Environment Working Group to serve as a platform for renewing and resetting the tenuous US-Pakistan relationship as addressing climate change and promoting regional stability and security is in the interest of both countries. Let me mention here that there's another, uh, I mean, coupling uh, opportunity. That is that both Pakistan and US are co-chairs on the board of the Green Climate Fund. So it is also an opportunity to, to really harness that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that potential. So instead of the current socioeconomic development agenda, which is in vogue, we normally have our ADPs, all those processes, planning processes, development agendas, uh, based on socioeconomic development, all the relevant institutions of Pakistan, including military, should jointly work on an integrated climate change, sustainable development, and national security agenda that can comprehensively for comprehensively respond to the complex poly crisis being uh, experienced by Pakistan. So I, I just found this diagram in the literature, which really says it all. This, uh, the core triangle is the sustainable development uh, uh, the triangle, and it has been developed after the Rio, and it has been evolved over point. And then it is engulfed by national security, whereas climate change is fully, uh, I mean, in, engulfing everything. So with this, I come to the last slide. I, I, I will like to give you three key takeaway questions that are mainly for our policy makers. One in the policy development process, is it a, a closed or an or a open consultation process? Two, is policy a gen generic document or a tool for action? Three, in policy administration, is it a central or a devolved process? Thank you very much for all, all of you for the patient hearing. That ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sahil. <clears throat> Your insights were incredibly valuable, as was the presentation. Uh, we shall now move on to our second speaker for the day, Dr. Khalil Khan. Country Director at CDRS, which is the Comprehensive Disaster Response Services, and a senior journalist with a specialty in the UN SDGs theory and action. Sir, what do you think is the state concern on climate change and its subsequent effects on national security? Uh, Dr. Khalil? Hmm. Sir, could you, yes, unmute your mic, mic, please, and whenever you're ready. Um, it looks like Dr. Khalil is having some technical difficulties. We shall revert back to him uh, in a few. All right. Um, we can now call upon Ms. Lareb Farhat, who is currently serving as an assistant research officer at the Institute of Regional Studies on the Climate Change Desk. Thus, the field is a forte of hers. Lareb, um, in lieu of the subject at hand, what effects do we think the threat of climate change will have on the peaceful and orderly livability of Pakistan? Um, thank you so much, uh, Mariam. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's 
it's lovely to be, it's an honor to be among uh, the panel of the learning, uh, learned uh, speakers. Uh, before I start my presentation, I'd just like to shed some light on the concepts that I wanted uh, for this audience to understand. Uh, beginning with the concept of the uh, environmental security that was given by the World Commission on Environmental uh, Environment and Development by in 1987, and it was uh, in the international discourses. The the concept of environmental security was in the inter, uh, international discourses by 1980s, but unfortunately, it hasn't still gotten into the Pakistani academic discourses as of yet. Why do I think that in, the concept is important in this regard? Is is because it takes the flights from the nation states of uh, identity, territory, and sovereignty, and rather puts some values on the uh, issues of environmental change uh, leading to ecology, globalist, and governance. So uh, if the, the concept of environment change was just related to the preservation of biodiversity and ecology, it would, the definition itself would have been restricted to the term ecology itself, but the definition exceeds uh, ecology and it goes beyond saying that we need to have a global perspective on environmental security and we need to have a cooperative government that would solve the issues of the current climate crisis. Now, uh, why Pakistan's factor is important and uh, as uh, you have already posed the questions of the peaceful and orderly livability of Pakistan, then uh, it's important that we mention that Pakistan is ranked uh, as the eighth country in the world, which is most vulnerable to the long time long-term climate risk. And uh, when we talk about the vulnerability of Pakistan to climate risk, it's important that we also consider some of the facts, uh, some of the internal conditions of the Pakistan that uh, the country faces itself. Uh, for example, the role of the non-state actors, the role of the economic uh, situation currently looming in the country, all of it combines together to give birth to uh, a current crisis. These this two layers of risk give rise to another risk of crisis, which is known as the climate crisis, which is going to be a threat to the national security. Now, uh, it's important that we realize that Pakistan is first already a flashpoint, political flashpoint. Secondly, this uh, political instability give rise to dovetailed with the climate crisis, give uh, rise to five kind of social effects that the country is experiencing right now and is going to experience at a further length uh, in the coming decades. Number one, constrained agricultural uh, productivity. Number two, constrained economic productivity. Number three, migration. Number four, social segmentation. And number five, disruption of legitimate institutions. Now, how does, the question is that how does these social effects turn into security threat and uh, increases the burden on the national security policies of the country of how they could collaborate and work towards uh, uh, towards inculcating a policy that has preserved not only environment, but also the security of the country. Uh, let me run you uh, through some facts, right? So 90% of Pakistan's irrigation demand is fulfilled by Indus Basin and its tributaries, which is currently at threat. Uh, if you have noticed that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, recent AR6 synthesis report puts high confidence of likelihood on abrupt and perceptible change in the price there, which means the melting of glaciers, the melting of ice, uh, the melting of uh, uh, glaciers and ice caps, uh, which increases the global surface temperature, meaning that this Cryos, this irreversible changes in the cryosphere is making Indus Basin, Indus Basin a tipping point for South Asia, specifically for Pakistan and India, which are already in a confrontational position in front of each other. So what we need to do, uh, recommendation number one, we need to improve our agriculture system by installing a more modernized irrigation drainage, drainage system, which means that we need to improve our water allocation and management practices. With that, we need to inst uh, we need to grow crops that are less water intensive. Right now, we're growing plants which are more uh, uh, water con uh, consuming and more water intensive. So we need to move towards that. Um, number three, we need to uh, remove the subsidy on the electric tubers and move more towards the improving drip irrigation and uh, crop rotation. Secondly, we need to develop a triple nexus, humanitarian development and peace nexus. Why? Uh, we see that the districts in South Punjab and North um, uh, since still have poverty rates that go beyond between 16, uh, 26 and 39%, while some districts in 
southeastern uh, south sindh and uh, some area of balochistan and bordering uh, some area of bordering kp they they have poverty rates between 40 and 60 percent now what are we doing these areas are already very vulnerable for example they have uh, they, they have very less access to schooling uh no access almost middle to zero access to health services water sanitation um access to electricity leading to energy crisis. What we need to do is that these situations make these communities more vulnerable than other communities in the face of a climate disaster. So what happens is that when a climate disaster hit, the vulnerability of these uh, people increases tenfold. So what we need to do is that we need to develop a triple nexus that the humanitarian development and peace interlinkages this, these sectors could take into account both immediate and long-term needs of the affected populations and enhance the opportunities of peace in these conflicted zones. Similarly, uh, we need to develop uh, migration, uh, as uh, Mr. Sugil has already mentioned, the, the point of migration. I want to just emphasize a little bit on it, that migration is a, is, is a phenomenon that we cannot escape at this moment, keeping in view our current climate uh, implementation of our current climate policy. So what we need to do is that we need to develop um, uh, developmental plans, effective developmental plans for the smaller cities to minimize rural to urban migrations. Because according to the World Bank study, South Asia will experience an estimated 17 to 36 million internal climate migrants by the year 2050. So uh, first we need to develop uh, smaller uh, developmental plans for smaller cities, but I know that kind of become impossible keeping view our institutional capacity. So if that is is a, is a is a hurdle between this uh, policy reform, what we can do is that we can uh, we can get over with the unplanned growth of uh, the urban areas. What we can do is that we can move towards more green spaces in the urban urban areas to uh, make place for these migrants, give them um, uh, give them proper. Uh, access to education, uh, creates job for them, and create plans for migration post and pre-disaster. So this would put a less burden on the cities that are already being uh, burdenized with uh, the increasing population. Similarly, um, real focus on adaptation is here. That's the Article 7 of the Paris Agreement states that we need to have uh, enhanced adaptive capacity, we need to strengthen the resilience and we need to reduce the vulnerability to the climate change with a view to ensure that the adequate adaptation response in the context of the 1.5 degree centigrade goal as referred in Paris Agreement remains alive and is effective. So we need to have adaptation plans um, in place, but it's important that when you talk about adaptation plan right now, the discourse is being carried out to develop a national adaptation plan, which is very important, but national is just not enough. We need to realize that one shoe size doesn't fit all. We need to have district and the sea level adaptation plan uh, because there's no single solution that would be applied to this uh, national solution that could be applied to district and the sea level. For these cities, we need to make tailored, customized and specified plans. Um, Similarly, we need to uh, develop, so for social economic development, we need to develop shock response with social protection. First, the early warning system is very important. Uh, we need to develop these anticipatory deployment uh, system that could stop the shock from converting from converting from shock to, into a crisis. We need to stop that. And secondly, in terms of the social protection, we need to introduce cash emergency cash transfer and uh, we need to coordinate these emergency crash transfers with the national social protection systems uh, for more effective and uh, more uh, apt response to the shocks. Um, another thing that we need to have is that first, first point of addressing a climate change issue is seeing it from an intersectional approach. So we need to realize climate change as a threat multiplier. And we need to see that we need to have an intersectional approach in solving this because climate change apparently affects everything with regards to agriculture, to food security, sea level rises, heat waves, and all other related factors, right? So for that purpose, we need to have a narrative focused people-centered approach. What we can do is that we can build our policies on the stories and on the experiences of these people who are already being affected by the climate change. This helps us make tailored, customized policies for the country, for the, for the district and Tessi level, in, because we cannot just make policies sitting in the capital for a district like Thar and uh, in, for uh, cities like Balochistan, because 
we are not in their shoe we have not in, in their lived experiences so we need to have narrative based people centered approach in this in that regard um then i cannot emphasize it enough that we need to have a gender climate security nexus uh, which is very important we uh, the agriculture sector 65% of the women in pakistan it's the biggest employer we contribute so much to agriculture but the thing is that uh, before the floods even before the floods they were in a in a deplorable condition they were denied labor rights they were employed without the fit of contracts they were given less wages lesser wages than men but even after the floods they are they are facing increased gender based violence uh, with regards to their reproductive health with regards to their um their uh, physical psychological conditions and uh, you know when when policies like when 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 discourses like providing menstrual uh providing a uh, sanitation to women during their menstrual cycle becomes a question in the debate then it's important to realize that what we're missing right now is a is an inclusive policy making in climate change because we don't have a structure where they where, where we need to break the shackles of these patriarchal structures um another thing that we need to focus on uh is the debt for nature swaps what we need to realize that right now we're faced with food crisis first is the environmental degradation which is the loss of biodiversity and the second is the inability of the low income countries to pay huge debt that we own to the global north so um this was a system that was first introduced in the 1980s but it's still uh, right in these current eras it's taking uh, a leap of faith and people are started to uh, consider debt for nature swaps uh, in order to uh, in order to sustain their biodiversity so what happens is that in debt for nature swaps countries which are under external debt their um, their debt has been their, their external get a debt gets laid off with regards to uh, installation of some biodiversity and nature based nature based solutions so i think this is one of the good solutions that we can um improve and sri lanka also is uh, right now doing adopting this habit adopting this uh, policy framework last but not the least um all the recommendations and the discussion points that i have carried out up till now is is impossible to do until unless we have a, a built up and increased and enhanced and elevated institutional capacity an integrated approach it is impossible uh, after the 18th amendment if the interprovincial government for interprovincial ministry for coordination does not bridge a gap between the ministry of information ministry of water ministry of agriculture because all of these ministries right now from my experience as a researcher i can say that all of these ministries right now is working in silos they are not working integratedly they are working in silos what we need to do is that we need to build a gap build a bridge between them and we need to tell them that um without without the cross referencing of their climate policies nationally uh, nationally and uh, district wise or tehsil wise without a cross reference of the, these all these climate policies it is impossible to implement a whole some climate integrated action that could preserve the national security without an integrated process it's impossible and wrapping up with that i'll just uh, uh, just highlight my first point that this is this is this can be done only if we just embrace the concept of environment not just as an environment we need to move out of the carbon tunnel vision we need to move towards the vision of environmental security and we need to minimize the environmental damage and promote a sustainable livelihood for people for centuries to come for generations to come that will live in a in a sustainable future for us uh with that being said i sign off thank you so much thank you so much larib um now we will revert back to dr khalil e khan he has finally joined us um sir the question that i would like to pose to you is again what do you think is the state concern on climate change and its subsequent effects on national security hello so we can't hear you cannot hear you again can't hear you sir
Uh, sir, could you uh, disconnect your earphones and try if the device's microphone would work? No, we still can't hear you. <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure if we can fix this. Right, sir. Thank you for your effort, nonetheless. Um, so what we can do now maybe is move on to a Q&A session and uh, see if Dr. Khalil can join us in the meantime. Um, we're open to any questions that anybody might have. Please feel free to ask. Does anybody have any questions here? Uh, okay, in the meantime, while we still receive questions from everybody, I would like to pose a question and um, see whoever would like to answer this in our panel. Um, so the question is, what? how does climate change affect Pakistan's water resources in particular, and what implications does it have for national security? considering the country's heavy reliance on agriculture and its um, water intensive industries and the fact that water and our main supplies of water are usually um, a, a source of conflict with our neighboring country. So how do we think, Mr. Suhail, um, how do we think we can tackle that problem? Okay, um, I will just, uh... Uh, say uh, just to quote my experience uh, 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 when I started my professional career um, with uh, with uh, I mean it, interestingly it was with the Navajo Nation in the U.S. that was back in eighties and uh, I was doing my PhD at that time and I was approached that the Navajo government would like to look into a Pakistani professional who can help them in water rights. So for me, uh, even though I was a student, but for me, it was a challenge. But that opened a lot of venues that uh, where, where one can uh, appreciate and understand that water, even 80s, even before, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a historically, it's one of the key issues of, of uh, Conflicts, I can say, because it was within the U.S. It was a conflict between four states and Mexico, so they had to resolve it on the water sharing. So why I'm saying is that water has always been an issue uh, historically, and for us in Pakistan, it really is a. Uh, I would say it's a lifeline for Pakistan because our uh, water resources are coming from beyond the borders. So, I mean, I mean if, I, if I look at it, uh, it's an issue which uh, needs a redressal on, an, uh, on a war footing, that until uh, unless we have, uh, I mean, the immediate kind of a, a, a strategy or a plan to look into the issue, where do we stand in the whole process? How does the water from the source get onto the fields and what are the uh, issues evolving around it? Is it, uh, uh, I mean, how are the issues which are interstate? How are the issues which are interprovinces? How are the issues within, within the communities at the uh, level where uh, all these things happen? And this all gets aggravated by climate change because climate change with droughts and floods, both are, for me, they are both uh, kind of destroying the whole water uh, resource, or also, I, I, if I may add, the the heat spikes. Uh, they are uh, they are destroying our powerhouse, the uh, glacier powerhouse, and then we have a very poor um, storage capacity. We don't have 
uh, I mean, uh, the way to store the water. We don't have uh, things where uh, people uh, from their daily lives, they have these practices, individual level, to the, uh, to the community level, to the government level, to the state level, this water has to be seen as a, a lifeline for Pakistan. I mean, that's the only thing I can say. I can talk a lot about different dimensions, but for me, it's a lifeline for Pakistan uh, from a technical perspective. If we, are, uh, if we don't look at it in a, uh, in a priority manner, if we don't have a discussion amongst all the stakeholders, I keep on stressing. I was earlier uh, uh, kind of having uh, uh, working on the idea of integrating sustainable development and climate change. But I mean, uh, uh, then with the time, I realized that the security part of it is, is in, it's, it encompasses everything. So in the end, climate change, to just wrap it up, climate change is a risk. I mean, it's a, it's a high risk thing, which if is not mitigated or addressed with priority at all levels will create uh, uh, will create a scenario where it will uh, kind of uh, threaten our existential uh, i mean it will threaten the existential issues even of pakistan i'll stop here and uh, i mean I, it's just a question i just wanted to uh, respond just immediately thank you very well, much you you gave us a very well-rounded um, response to that question. We have another question uh, from Shahzeb. Uh, this is directed to both um, Mr. Sohail Malik and Lareb. So whichever one of you would like to answer this first. So the question is, uh, it's, in, it's in the question chat box. If you would like me to read it out, we could also do that. Or you could refer to the okay. question. If, if Sir Sohail allows, I can, I can respond to it. Right, perfect. Please, please, with player. Okay, okay, great. Um, so the question states that, uh, do you think there is a private sector investment in medica medi mitigating and adapting the impacts of climate changes can have a positive impact? So um, I'll just refer to uh, a bit this question to, to our NDCs, the nationally determined contributions that we have submitted in 2021. It says that we need to have uh, in line the nature-based solutions, but we also need to have uh, an intervention in the technology-based solutions. So the technology-based solutions cannot be achieved without a public-private partnership. Secondly, um, our vision is to reduce uh, the 50% of, uh, of our projected emissions by the year 2050. And similarly, we, for that, we need to move towards uh, the uh, electric vehicles to avoid the emissions to, add, to avoid adding more to the global greenhouse gases. So that uh, the, the implementation of the electric vehicles is impossible without keeping in place a public-private partnership. So I think it's important that the public makes the policy and the private sector invest uh, because the capacity that it brings with itself is 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 the investment. So we need to have that partnership to move forward and to to mitigate the effects of climate change because it's uh, not possible without moving moving without a partnership between these two uh, entities. Thanks. So if you allow me to add to uh, what Lariat has said, I think. Uh, it's, it's a very good question uh, because it, it it really deals with the uh, with the overall global ambition of uh, uh, I mean uh, climate change on both fronts. It's, uh, it's on the fronts of TNT emission reduction as well as uh, climate resilient uh, development pathways. So I mean this touches upon that. And if I may uh, rely on my uh, GCF experience because I was heading the portfolio there. And uh, there it was very clear that uh, private sector would be the vehicle to, uh, to fill the gap between ambition and accomplishment. Only uh, public sector cannot uh, fill this gap because the ambition is so high. If you look at the targets of climate change uh, set by Paris Declaration, they are so high and the gap is so overwhelming that private sector in fact provides the vehicle to, uh, to, to really multiply or to, to take us in, in an accelerated way towards the targets. Public sector can, can provide a, a, a favorable uh, environment or a favorable 
uh, I mean, uh, they can cover the risk because the uh, issue of private sector is of risks. And there are other risks which uh, Lareb had mentioned earlier in her presentation that we, we uh, and I also mentioned about polycrisis. When you have such issues of uh, foreign exchange, uh, I mean, uh, issues, we, we have the issue of our uh, reserves and all that and uh, attracting private sector investment. And then on top of it, you try to bring in uh, the climate change uh, angle in there. It really adds on to the challenge. But what I can say very confidently and based on my experience with climate change, uh, Green Climate Fund, that uh, none of the ambitions can be even uh, considered reachable if there is no meaningful participation of the private sector. So uh, uh, the funds, the global funds for uh, climate, including uh, Green Climate Fund, uh, I mean, that's why they are, uh, they are the ones which take the risks. Unlike the development finance, climate finance is supposed to take the risk, which is alien to development finance. Development finance shies away from the risk. They don't assume the risk. So why they take the risk uh, uh, green Climate Fund or likewise funds are, that they know that without covering the risk, it will be impossible to bring in the climate, uh, the private sector within this, uh, uh, within this uh, journey of combating, uh, combating climate change. I, I can say more about it and I like the question, Shahzeb. Uh, I mean, I can talk on it for hours because that's, that's close to my heart, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Khalil, can you try and see if we can hear you this time? We cannot hear you again. Um, this is some sort of bug. Uh, we're very sorry that this is happening, but um, we have another question. If, um, again, the same two speakers would like to address this. Uh, the question is in the chat box. Uh, CC is targeting globally, regardless of borders, et cetera. Our carbon per capita is perhaps much lower than many of our neighboring regions and countries. What should be done to keep our region on board with respect to climate change mitigation? I can take a first cut on this issue, if, if you allow me. Uh, sure, thanks. But, uh, this is something which again is very important that uh, one Pakistan has to remain a part of the global community. It cannot uh, just say that uh, we have less than 1% uh, emission, so uh, we need not get into the mitigation. Uh, we, we are not supposed to get into and also that we are on the receiving end of these uh, uh, mitigation uh, or mismitigations done earlier due to industrialization. So we should not be a part of it. I have a very different take because there is this whole issue of carbon. Carbon trading is now coming back into the scene. Uh, earlier it was discontinued because it was something which was started after the Kyoto Protocol. Pakistan is in a way uh, blessed, I, I, I can I can make this very uh, very strong statement that in the region you have China and India, both have high mitigations, high emissions, not mitigations. So they whatever they uh, I mean carbon credits they create, they need it for themselves first to really stay at the uh, uh, at the target of being uh, carbon free. So for Pakistan, we, we have no such compulsion. But what does it mean? We, that means that we can become a hub because at this moment, what we are looking at is the possibility of investments, possibility of money coming in. I'm glad UAE took the initiative for COP28, before COP28, and they are setting up a carbon trading center. Whereas they are perceived by the world in with different lens, being the polluters. Let me be very open, frank on it. 
Whereas Pakistan is very, very, I mean, uh, I would say uh, bigger in this respect. But having said so, we would like to see carbon credits being uh, realized, being, uh, uh, being recorded, uh, being having a registry, and also being traded. Why I say that is that let's not see uh, mitigation and adaptation separately. Now, this uh, Ali, uh, uh, Ali Asnan, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm making a very, I mean, a, a point which you should understand very uh, clearly that mitigation and adaptation should not be seen separately. What we are trying, if we go for uh, carbon credits, carbon capital, what we are trying to do is to uh, create resources for ourselves to fund adaptation. I mean, mitigation, if we have carbon credits, it, it is so simple. And we have, uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of carbon credit generated in, in so many uh, different, uh, I mean, we are blessed by nature also in so many ways. So why can't we have those carbon credits traded money gotten, I mean, it, it, some people may, uh, uh, I mean, uh, label me as a, a morally wrong or incorrect. But what I'm saying is this is a nature gift to us, but we use those revenues, not for other things. We use those revenues to, to address our highly needed ad adaptation needs. So we are linking the mitigation uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 income or using it as uh, financing the adaptation. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Lareb, I have a, another question for you. Essentially, um, it revolves around diplomacy. How can climate diplomacy and regional cooperation contribute to managing the security risks arising from climate change in Pakistan? And are there any existing <laughs> frameworks or initiatives that we can also focus on to deal with this issue. I'm sorry, can you just repeat the first part of your question? I certainly must said. How can climate diplomacy and regional, regional con um, cooperation contribute to managing the security risks arising from climate change in Pakistan? Okay, so um, I think first thing that we need to realize is that uh, climate diplomacy, uh, this also relates to the question which, which is which was asked by, I think, Mr. Ali Hassan earlier. So climate diplomacy is, this is the decade of climate diplomacy. We cannot just buy our way out. We need to sit with the countries. We need to discuss our issues. We need to tell them that, um, okay, Indus Basin is at threat. The Himalayas are melting. So what do we do? We need to sit together and talk about it, that how the, that when 90% of our, our irrigation system depends on the Indus Basin, how do we make this, how do we turn this threat into uh, into something that doesn't pose or uh, uh, come at our national security? So we need to sit with countries, especially when it comes to India and keeping in view the, the current modification required by the uh, by the India's, uh, Indian side on the Indus Water Treaty. I think it's a it's a threat that we need to mitigate right now on the spot because it's important because the threats are now coming on the shared resources. So diplomacy, this is, I, I kept on reiterating that this is the era of climate diplomacy. We need to sit together. We need to develop regional cooperation. We need to revive the already available uh, of cooperative uh, the organizations, the multilateral arrangements that we have in place, the the SAR, the ASEAN, ASEAN the even the BIMSTEC that, that we usually talk about. So we need to revive these organizations to come together and talk about the menace of climate change that the world is uh, facing today. Because uh, currently we have seen two major issues on the shared water resources. The first is the Indus water, the Indus basin, and the second me in the recent past of the. Uh, clash between the Iran and the Afghanistan forces regarding the, the Treaty on the Helmand River, which is literally depleting these uh, in the current situation. So um, diplomacy is the way, uh, talking your way out of the uh, negotiations, uh, sitting together and uh, drafting a solution of how do we manage these shared resources and how do we manage our water allocation? Is this is the solution? Thank you. If I may also come in on this issue, if you allow me, uh, because I think uh, I would add to what Lareb has said. Uh, 
for Pakistan, I think, I'm sorry for this doubt because we are in the power transition, so you may not be able to see me. It's just uh, the load shedding. Um, um, climate di diplomacy is uh, becoming very important uh, globally. So Pakistan, uh, fortunately, were on the global scene in the last COP27 COP with loss and damages. So I think uh, Pakistan did a sterling job in 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 uh, in uh, in uh, using the leadership of G77 to bring the agenda on the table, not only on the table, but really take it forward in a uh, in a pragmatic manner. So we did grab this opportunity. Issue is that at the moment at the U uh, Security Council. Uh, it's every year there is an appreciation of climate change as a security threat or as a threat is creeping in. They have not passed any resolution yet, but we are almost there. We will have a resolution very soon. So Pakistan, one at that level can play that role because that could bring a lot of dividends down the line and I can go on on that. But now the most important thing is that in, diplom in, in climate diplomacy, Pakistan, should carry the strength, what they showed in the last COP, to COP28 and onwards, to make sure that the implementation framework they, uh, they brought out now has the action plan followed up. Now the action plan has to roll out. And that's where Pakistan, even though G77 uh, leadership is not, it's a yearly leadership for 2023, we don't have it. But everyone in G77 appreciates Pakistan's role in loss and damages. So we can uh, capitalize on that and we can be in the forefront. I would say that uh, our people from different uh, ministries, as they did an excellent job in coming together, finance, foreign, uh, foreign office, climate change, they, the, those, those people who did that, they should come together along with the experts humble experts, which are uh, your part of your forum also, to, to really kind of uh, take this uh, uh, the ball and not just leave it for the next people to take it. Keep carrying this ball on the diplomatic front. So climate diplomacy for me, uh, you have raised the question very rightly because we are now at the run up to COP28 and now we have to discuss it. We don't have to discuss it a couple of months down the line. Uh, otherwise it will be too late. We need to carry the ball now, not later. Thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Um, we will now be closing the webinar for today. Uh, if uh, Mr. Junjua could deliver a short closing sentence, that would be great. Thank you very much. I think uh, a very fascinating discourse and uh, kudos to uh, the distinguished speakers, Mr. Suhail Malik and uh, Mare from IRS. I think uh, you captured it all. Climate change is a veritable threat to national security and uh, nobody understands this better than Ipri where uh, the lineaments of our national security policy were formed under the leadership of our former NSA. And uh, if we see uh, our national security policy document, which is publicly available, that document clearly uh, apportions a weightage to the climate threats and uh, the need to mitigate those threats. And we have seen that Pakistan uh, both at government level and at uh, non-government level, has been very proactive at international forums. Uh, we have had a very uh, good uh, presence on COP27 and uh, forthcoming uh, COP in UAE. I think uh, there's an inter-government uh, panel already seized with the responsibility. And uh, there are climate activists like... Uh, Mr. Aisha Malek, who have done a, a great job, and uh, Aisha Khan, sorry. And uh, I believe uh, Pakistan has highlighted the issue of loss and damages, and I think the loss and damages clause is a very important uh, success, and we can build on that. Because uh, 
it's very clear that we are one of the minimal contributors, but the maximum uh, impact is upon us. We live in a part of the world where uh, we have a very unique uh, geography. We have a uh, Indus uh, watershed whose gradient hydrology and slopes, those are very unique. And uh, contrary to the rest of the world where the precipitation is evenly spread, 80% of the precipitation takes place in just two months. And the gradients which uh, start uh, debouching from the mountain fastnesses of Karakram and Himalayas and go all the way to the plains of Punjab and then Arabian Sea. So it, the gradient is so fast and the timings is so the time window is so less that uh, flash floodings, the possibility of uh, glacial lake outfalls, the impact of uh, sudden precipitation, heat waves, the climate change, and its impact on growth of our uh, uh, you know, important crops like wheat. This is a palpable indicator, the coming uh, threat. And the threat is uh, already being an unfolded. It's not the question of something that we uh, envision in future. The impact is already upon us. And uh, if we calculate, there is, there is empirical evidence to the tune that there are deaths in the deserts of Thar because of famine, because of uh, droughts and climate change and the impact of the floods. If you combine the human uh, security cost, that exceeds what we lost uh, in the terrorism threats and uh, other threats which are uh, you know, man-made. So, this is a thread that we all should be seized with. And a very important point was uh, given in the presentation by Mr. Suhail Malik once he raised the issue that the post-Westphalian notion of nation states where each nation jealously guards its territorial sovereignty might become uh, a difficult proposition when the area has become unlivable. If there is uh, a human catastrophe in one part of the world and the populations might start migrating and those migrations would be massive, humongous. So those are the issues that entire humanity has to be seized with. And uh, it's uh, incumbent upon the countries in the north to have an empathy with those in the south, which are uh, mostly impacted because of the activities that the industrial west has already done. And uh, the carbon imprint, decarbonization, the climate change measures at the global level and the role of the UN and international uh, organizations. That is vital. And that is only going to uh, be fructified once the leading nations like uh, United States of America, European Union and the Chinese, they take full cognizance of this uh, looming threat and uh, they treat those that are impacted mostly uh, the kind of global uh, south and the developing countries with due empathy. And I'm sure such like webinars are uh, very important pointers towards the looming threat. And we will gather and we'll uh, capture the necessary uh, recommendations and the themes and try and give those uh, ideas, the maximum tractions with the policy makers. With this, I thank the distinguished panelists and we would like uh, them to be with us in uh, similar future interactions. So thank you very much and uh, Raf is from my side. Thank you everyone. Um, and thank you to Mr. Janjua. As we end today's discussion, I would like to extend my gratitude on behalf of IPRI to all our speakers, our attendees and um, our director of research it is, after all, only through collective and active discourse that we can chart a path towards a better handle on the issues that our nation is facing. I would also like to extend my gratitude to JS Bank for their contribution in helping us host events that contribute to policy debates in the country. Thank you for taking time out of a busy workday to join us for this event. Everybody, I wish you a very good day and a laugh us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Allah.